Come on. Here we go. Well, I'm, la- I'm honoured, to really, to be honest this morning. I'm super honoured because I get to launch this new series called Together in one place and you are going to be so pleased that you are in the room this morning because this is the morning where being together in one place will change everything and I'm just so excited that you're here. I'm pumped to be here. I'm pumped to be bringing this message and if you're joining us online, oh, I'm so pleased you're with us. I think it would have been better for you to be here in the room. Uh, if you're listening back later this week, then you know where to be on Sunday and that's here with the gathered people of God. And so this morning, as I launched this series, Together in One Place, I've entitled this message, Five Ways Church Changes Everything. Five Ways Church Changes Everything. And I have a bit to get through, so I kind of want to jump straight into it. But I've also just kind of intentionally left some room in this message for the Holy Spirit to maybe just stir me so that I can bring something for you that might be specific for where you're at. So I've left room in the message for that. So let me just jump into this passage, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. It's on the screen for you. It says, On the day Pentecost was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place. And also, just let me say, I need your help. This is is, is all about being together in one place. I mean, if if you're not part of this message, then why are you here? You've got to participate. You just, I mean, Zara gets the privilege of worship leading and you're all up there, you know, yeah, Zara, woo, you're raising your hands, you're singing along. And then I get up here and you all just sit and look at me. So you are going to participate in this message because we're together in one place. All right, are we ready? Okay, so all the disciples were gathered in one place and suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from, uh, from the heavenly realm. And the roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all anyone could bear. Then all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. And they were all filled and equipped. Everybody say equipped. 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 With the Holy Spirit. And were inspired. Everybody say inspired. inspired. That's right. To speak in tongues and empowered. Everybody say empowered. empowered. By the Spirit to speak in languages they had never learned. When we're together in one place, the Holy Spirit will show up and will be equipped and empowered and inspired to do things that only are possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is uh, further on in the passage. It says this. It says, Every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually, see this, mutually linked. It's this, it's this language of being together, mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together. Everybody say together. together. That's the way you're starting to... Catch on. A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers were in fellowship as one body as they shared with one another what they had. And it goes on to say, it says, daily they met together. That was a mess. Let's try that again. I'll say after me, then say together. Don't say it beforehand. I know you're very intelligent people. The other 600 people that aren't here today must be the slow ones. So let's just try that again. Daily they met together. Everybody say together. Together. That's right. In the temple courts and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals. Everybody say together. Together. Together with joyful hearts and tender humility. See, this text, the author of this text, Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts, he was absolutely telling a theological story here. He wasn't just retelling historical events. However, that was the basis of the book. It was an historical account. However, he was telling it in such a way to, to communicate a theological paradigm to establish the identity of the church. That's you and me. He was showing his listeners what a new community was meant to look like. This isn't, this isn't just accidental. Luke is intentionally curating a passage for us. It's not just like we've taken a video camera image of the first church. Luke is saying, this is what it should look like. He's saying, it kind of looked like this, but let me make it very clear to you. This is exactly what the community of faith must look like. What he's saying is that if the church was everything the church was meant to be, it would be changing the world. 
and you would be a world changer. And you would have your world changed in the process. If the church were all together in one place and the Spirit of God changed you, then you would change everything. It's, it's what Luke is saying to us as the church. He's saying, guys, this is the secret source. It's the, it's the inside knowledge. It's the thing you always wished you knew. It's, it's the hot tip. It's the game changer. It's the rocket fuel. It's the favour of God. It's, it's like being in the right place at the right time. It, it's, it's knowing the right people. It's the advantage for life, for business, for relationships, for marriage, for family. This is what it is to be the local church. It is, how, it is to have the odds of life stacked in your favour. This is what Luke is showing us in this text. This the church together like this changes absolutely everything. But what, what sometimes goes wrong with this idealistic picture of the church? Well, I know that we put our worries ahead of God's promises. See, God promises that if we build his house... He builds ours. God promises that if we build his house, he will build ours. But sometimes we worry that God won't follow through on his word. It's true. We we take back control sometimes of our time. We take back control sometimes of our finances. We take back control sometimes of our agenda. And we start doing God's job for him. We put our worries ahead of his promises. But here we, here's some good news. We're not alone. You're not the first person to ever distrust a trustworthy God. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 9, have a look on the screen. This is the prophet speaking to the Old Testament church, the people of Israel. He said this, You hoped for rich harvest. Yes, of course we hope for rich harvest. But they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house, God's house, Lies in ruin, says the Lord of heaven's armies, while you are all busy building your own fine houses. Now, of course, God wants us to have homes. But God says, what's most important? What's the most valuable thing to you? Is it what I've called you to build or is it for you to build your own life first? Because God promises that if we build his house, he will build ours. The New Testament equivalent from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. I mean, this is after the church had been born. It had only been around probably for a, maybe a few decades. And the writer in Hebrews, he says to the church, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging one another and helping out, not only, uh, sorry, not avoiding to, uh, worshipping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. See, this is the church. This is a very young church. It's not because we've been around for 2,000 years that we're just sick and tired of coming to church. It didn't take long for the church to say, no, I've got other things to do. I've got other places to be. I've got better things on. I've got to take my kids to the first century soccer match. I've got to take them to the, 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 the Colosseum. We've got to watch some centurions murder some lions. So there were some things we've got to do. And Paul's saying, well, don't forget to gather together because some people are in the habit of not being all together in one place. Now, yesterday, I was bringing Max home from work. And so one of the places that Max works is like 15 minutes. So it's a 15-minute drive to work and back. So I was, taking, I was picking him up in the afternoon. And Rachel said when I left, she said to me, I'm going to light a fire while you're gone. I was like, oh, great. So come home in the afternoon. There'll be a lovely fire in the backyard. I'll be able to sit outside and put our feet up and enjoy the warmth of the fire. And so when got Max came back home, I've arrived. And out through the back window, I could see smoke. No fire. I said, Rachel, oh, what happened to the fire? Uh, I thought she might have said, oh, yeah, look, I had a fire and put it out. I was sick of it. No, she said, oh, I just wasted the last half of my, half hour of my life trying to light this fire. I'm not going to waste any more time on it. That's it. And so she just was like, that's it. So, okay, that's fine. So I went outside just to investigate the fire. And uh, within about two minutes, I had this, I had this ignition. I had this 
furious fire. And I thought, what was she doing wrong? But what, <laughs> what, this is what I haven't told her yet. And I'll let you know, I'll let you in on the little secret. Uh, was that what Rachel didn't know is that if she had have stayed just probably one more minute and, and maybe given it one more puff of oxygen or one more little piece of newspaper, she would have seen <laughs> fire. <laughs> so I really didn't do much. I mean, I went out there and, I mean, it was nearly lit. I just kind of went, <laughs> and it just kind of went up in flames. <laughs> and and I, as I'm doing that, I'm thinking, this is, this is what church can be like. And I've heard people say to me before, oh, I've tried church before. Uh, you know, nothing really happens. Or I went to church for a while, for a few months maybe, and, you know, nothing really happened. You know, some people even, and because it had been raining, a lot of the wood was actually quite wet. And, and a lot of people spend so much time away from church uh, that it's like their, their wood has gotten wet. And that even when they come back to church, it seems to take so long for them to be on fire for Jesus again. And I thought that's, a, that's an interesting thought. You know, you might not actually know how close you are to ignition. You might not actually know how close you are to catching on fire for Jesus if you just give it maybe one more week <laughs> or maybe one more month or maybe one more year. It could just be that next week's the week where I come out and just whoosh, and bang, fire, or just a little bit more fuel and bang, fire, or just that moment. You could just be one moment away from ignition or reignition. And, and in church, what I know is this, that if you're in church, if you're in the fire pit, if you're in church, you're closer than you think to a life ablaze for Jesus. You might be sitting there thinking a little bit wet today, a little bit, a little bit stale, a little bit dry. Well, you are in the right place at the right time because today could be your day where the Holy Spirit breathes something fresh on your life and you catch a blaze for Jesus in a way that you never thought was possible or you thought had passed you by. But out of church, out of the fire pit, I can tell you there's no chance of ignition with a fiery passion for Jesus. And so today, what I want to do, what I believe God wants us to do, is to be reminded that his way is better than our way. That gathering together in one place, in church, with our church community, with our church family, changes everything. And the Bible teaches us that there are five significant, powerful promises that change in our life when we are gathered together as the people of God in one place. So are you ready for these? Because what I want to do, these, these, these five thoughts, these five ways in which God changes our life when we're gathered together and sets us on fire, they're more than this. I don't want this just, just to be like dot points on your page of notes that you're taking. But I want these to be promises for you to receive for your life. Because guess what? You're in the room. You're here. So all of these are applicable to you. You don't have to go home and do these. They're happening now. This is the one time, the one message where you kind of don't even need to take notes. It's happening in the moment. Okay, so are you ready? All right. Everyone who usually takes notes, you can put your notepad away for now. No, you can, you can keep taking notes. Number one, the five ways that church changes everything is this divine blessing in psalm 133 love this passage new king james version it says behold how good and pleasant it is for people for brothers and sisters to dwell together everybody say together together in unity it is like the precious oil which is a picture of the spirit of god the anointing of god the empowerment of god the infilling the equipping of god pouring out upon your life from the top of your head to the tip of your toes it runs down all the way through aaron from the top of his head to the bottom of his toes it goes all over his body as a priestly garment it's too much to get into it's too much detail but it talks about authority presence power and it's a whole other study you can do on psalm 133 when you've got the time coming down from mount uh, the mountains of Zion, for there, for there, it says at the end of that passage, the Lord hopes that you're blessed. The Lord would like to see you receive a good portion. No, 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 no. The Lord commands a blessing. If God says it, it's happening. And it's happening right now in your life. So come on, with an open heart, you can receive divine blessing from God as you gather together in one place. The second thing we see the Bible teaches us, it is empowering encouragement to be together in one place. And I've read this verse to you, Hebrews 10.25. It's not time to pull away 
and neglect to meeting together. Do you think the author of Hebrews might have known something about the power of one place? Some have formed a habit of stepping away. He says, in fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other on as we anticipate the day drawing near. Ever felt discouraged? Ever prayed and longed for a supernatural infusion of courage to tackle the challenges you're facing? Well, you are in the right place at the right time. And I just prophesy courage over every single person in this room right now. And I want to encourage you, if you feel encouraged, to be an encourager. Don't take your courage home with you if you've got extra. Share it with the person next to you and give them some of the courage that you have too much of. Come on, let's be an encouraging people of God where we put courage into each other. Third thing that we see changes when we're gathered together in one place is we receive supernatural joy. In Proverbs 27 verse 9, it says, Sweet friendships. I've got a little sweet friendship I can see out of the corner of my eye right now. It's Matthew and Brendan in the front row. They've got a sweet little friendship going there. And uh, if they were in class together at school, I'd probably separate them. But in church, we bring them together. Come on. What's that verse? What are we talking about? Sweet friendships. Hey, sweet friendships refresh the soul and awaken our hearts with joy. For good friends are like the anointing oil. There it is again. Empowerment, equipment, equipping, inspiring that yields the fragrant incense of God's presence. What a powerful verse. There is joy for us as we gather together. And joy makes a difference. Did you know that people in my research for this message, yes, I do research these messages, people are 12% more productive when they're feeling joy. So if you've got employees that you want to crack the whip on, let's get them happy first, okay? Because happy people perform better. Uh, Joy has been linked to longevity. Wow. Negotiators are more likely to reach winning arguments when they're feeling joy. Amen. You can take that home with you for your spouse. Increased joy increases our connectedness to the people around us. And finally, the Bible says... The joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, let me read you these other statistics, some other research. And I've shared this with some of our team before. In a recent book, 2023, uh, the book's called She Deserves Better. It's uh, Raising Girls to Resist Toxic Teachings on Sex, Self and Speaking Up. This particular book, I think the stats that they pull out of this uh, survey, this research, are applicable across the board, not just for girls. So let me read you these statistics. And I, I think it's, it's indicative of what the effects of church have on our lives. So this is a a new survey of over 7,000 women in the US. It says Christian girls who attend church a few times a month were 20% more likely to have above average self-esteem. 20% more likely if they attend church a couple of times a month. Christian girls who attend church once a week were 70% more likely to have above average self-esteem. Above average, 70% more likely attend church once a week. That's enough of a game changer for me. I'm dragging my kids to church no matter what is happening. They're in the room. My girls, my boys. In fact, I think I should be in the room if that's the kind of stats I'm reading about the power of being all together in one place. Christian girls who attend more church more than once a week, so for example, they go to youth or a life group, they were 81% more likely to have above average self-esteem. That changes the game. That changes everything. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Speaking of strength, number four, superior strength is what is afforded to us when we're gathered together in one place as the body of Christ. Be by yourself, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, by yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third, a three-stranded rope, isn't easily snapped. Do you want an unbreakable life? An unbreakable life is available to us when we gather together in one place. Can you round up a friend? I mean, some of us are a little unfriendly, but I'm sure we can make some concessions just to get one person on side because if we have just one friend, our life is is hard 
to be shifted off course. We can face the worst. If you can find a third, a three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. I'm praying for us that we would have an unbreakable life, that we would not be easily snapped, easily broken. We'd be strong, stable, secure, steadfast, rock solid, immovable, unshakable. That's the kind of life that's promised when you are gathered together in one place. And finally, number five, if we go all the way back to our first verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says this is we can expect in a gathering like this today. Every believer, say, that's me. Every believer, say, that's me. Every believer was faithfully devoted to the, following, uh, to following the apostles' teachings. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. And see, when they did that, Luke was showing us something should happen. He said, hey, when this happened the first time, a deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone because they were all together in one place, sharing together, receiving the word together, in communion together. And when they were all together in one place, a, a, a sense, a deep sense of holy awe just kind of swept over the whole room. This is what Luke's saying in Acts. He's saying this is what it should look like when we gather together all in one place. Holy awe swept over everyone and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Miracles, signs and wonders are promised to the church when we gather together in one place. What is it that you're praying and believing God for? What's the impossible situation you're trying to face? Where do you need the miracle? Where do you need the breakthrough? Come on, where do you need hope to rise in your life? Where do you need a sign from heaven? You are in the right place at the right time. In a moment like this, God is felt. I just, I just know, I can sense right now that you, that you are sensing the presence of God. God is felt. You can sense that, that God's doing something right now, even in this moment. God is felt in this moment. God, the, 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 the deep sense of holy awe that just fills the room in a moment like this. Is what the local church is all about, that we can lift our expectations to believe God for what's beyond just the natural order of things. I wonder what you've settled for in your situation. I wonder what you've just resigned yourself to, to stop hoping for. And I want this moment to be one that reminds us that when we gather together in one place, it changes everything.